Good evening, everybody. Nice to see you online. Today, we will go on with the masterclass series, AI in Practice, kindly sponsored by Bayer. And we have the honor to have together with us, Eric Ransert. Eric is a visionary radiologist. He is a charismatic speaker and an acknowledged expert in the healthcare and imaging informatics. I can spend a lot of time talking about Eric, but I will limit myself only in half a minute talking about Eric's vision to promote the seamless integration of AI into the clinical practice, particularly into the workflow. He has done extensive research in the field. He has also gained a lot of expertise and experience working with entrepreneurs, startups, and, and big vendors in the field. And uh, today, he will exactly transmit us this expertise, pieces of its expertise in the next 20 minutes, and he will help us identify and select the right AI application. Welcome, Eric, and the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, Sotiris, for this kind introduction. And yes, I hope I can share some of my experience today in this presentation. Um, apparently, it's only 20 minutes, so I'll, I will do the best I can to give you as much information as possible. Now, can you please unmute yourself, Eric? You accidentally pressed the mute button. Yes, okay, thank you very much for that. So again, this is an overview of the presentation today. I will say a few words about the market evolution, the product choice, the vendor choice, the financing, and the implementation. This is the information I would like to give is more practical, let's say, focusing on the radiological practice. Now, this is the first slide to show you how the market is ev evolving. As you can see, there is a 60% increase, or there has been an enormous increase in the uh, market uh, starting in 2015. It's an exponential growth of the number of AI solutions that were launched in the market. So as you can see here, uh, a 60% increase has been um, uh, registered uh, of new CE marked AI solutions entering into the market. I would like to give you an overview. This is from a nice paper from Kiki van Leeuwen. Uh, what are the most apps uh, that appear in the market for radiology? Well, as you can see here, uh, a lot of these applications based on AI are intended for neuroradiology, but also there's a lot of possibilities for chest radiology. And then there's other subspecialties that also can use some AI applications, but to a lesser degree. Now, this is also an interesting um, diagram showing the number of, or the, the showing that the most applications are made for CT images, but also MRI is quite imp important and uh, normal X-rays, of course, as well. And I would, let's say, um, also consider mammography as part of that. Now, what is the current situation in the market? As, you, as I told you, the number of AI products is quite large and it's still increasing. We have now more than 200 commercial products available with a CE mark. And, but we can still see that the number of vendors, not the number of applications, but the number of vendors is quite stagnating. And yes, it's now we also arrived at a time where the vendors, they have invested a lot of money, of course, not only in the development, but also in the marketing of the products, but now really they it's kind of a critical moment because they they need some return on investment and what we can also see is that the market is predominantly predominantly supply driven so it's a little bit less demand driven the the, the market the demand is staying a little bit behind uh, but on the other side most radiologists as has been shown in some studies do have an open attitude towards ai but nevertheless the implementation is generally slower than expected. Now, what are the reasons for the slow market growth? Well, I, meant, I here I mentioned a few of them. Uh, first of all, in general, the medical community uh, is quite conservative. 
Um, at this moment, the, there is maybe insufficient evidence of the value or the efficiency of AI-based solutions. It's still difficult to define a business case for AI because, well, yes, there's also not really direct financing available. There's a lack of structural funding. That's what I wanted to say. And of course, we probably all know that there's long procurement cycles in hospitals in most hospitals. It might take several months to half a year or a year even. Um, often there's a lack of project management. It depends on the size of the hospital, of course. And the infrastructure also needs to be adapted, which is in many cases not the, the case. Now, um, as I said, the medical community is quite conservative. This is also what Mark Jan Harte from Aidens is still the CEO of Aidens. And um, he says that doctors like to work according to routine and follow protocols. They do not really deviate from this easily. So this uh, is at, at, at odds with innovation. And individual doctors, they might be enthusiastic about AI, but then the whole group or the whole profession uh, the professional group, at least in the hospital, uh, needs to be convinced. They also want to do their own study because they think their scanner or their protocol is slightly different. So if they are willing to change, um, if only they are willing to change the way they work, then they will implement it. And there's also not really collaboration between hospitals. So if you have a proven hospital or if a vendor is working with one hospital, uh, it doesn't mean that it will automatically also work in the other hospital. So every hospital wants to do it all over again. And uh, this is also the case for the vendors, of course. And yes, as I said, the hospitals have long procurement cycles. Now, what kind of solution should we choose? This is also an interesting website. You probably already know it. It's AI for Radiology. And there you can go and select the type of solution that you want to learn more about. You can select based upon the subspecialty or the modality, the type of CE mark, etc. So um, there's a, a lot of ways to find relevant information about the type of information that the type of solution that you are looking for. Something I really have to mention, uh, which I really like is the Eclair guidelines, uh, to which also Sotirios Business participated in writing, I'm sorry, this is a uh, Daniel Pinto dos Santos from our society, which also participated in this publication. Uh, it's the title is to buy or not to buy, and it provides you a way to select commercial AI solutions for radiology. So this is an overview of the type of subjects that you should think about. First of all, there's the relevance of the, of the application, meaning that you have to think about for what is it needed and for whom, what are the potential benefits and the risks of course, you also have to think about the performance and the validation of the algorithm. You have to verify this. And there's a few topics mentioned here, uh, what you have to look for. You have to, you have to think about the usability and the integration of the solution. So what will, be the inter what will be the impact on the workflow? How can we interact with other existing systems, et cetera? How can we interpret the results? Um, there's also some regulatory and legal aspects you have to think about. Um, of course, the compliance with MDR. And then, yes, you also have to think about the financial uh, solutions and the support that you will get from the vendor. Uh, I will tell a few words later about this, but of course, you have to think not only about uh, purchasing the software, but also about maintenance, monitoring the software, handling malfunctions, etc. So there's all that this is an important overview of how you should think about and, and how you should select the right AI solution solution. Now, what do radi radiologists really expect from AI? And an interesting uh, survey has been conducted by uh, European Society of Radiology. It's called the EuroAIM survey, um, in which a lot of participants, in what a lot of radiologists participated. And from this survey, it appears that a small majority of respondents had the expectation that AI could possibly reduce the radiologist workload. So it's only a small fraction because here you have the figures. So whereas uh, almost 75 expected an impact of AI on the reporting work, on the total reporting workload, almost 51% of them expected a reduced reporting workload and 49% expected the opposite scenario. So there is still some discussion about the usability of AI. 
So the speculation that AI will decrease workload has not been really supported yet by sufficient evidence and the effect on the future workload remains unclear. Another interesting publication from the European Society is about the current practical experience with AI in clinical radiology. And this is also a survey to, in which 276 radiologists participated from 229 countries, um, institutions in 32 countries. And what you can see here is that a lot of radiologists, they use AI, the, the majority actually, to assist them during interpretation of the um, examinations. Um, but also a lot of them um, expect that the workflow can be prioritized by using AI. So this is also one of the major expectations that radiologists have. And um, well, this is actually uh, also the, their experience, let's say, uh, the, the, the way they use it. So what do AI vendors actually promise? And how do they legitimize it? I just show you some slides of advertisements as you can find them. And here it says AI improves the entire radiology workflow from acquisition to prognosis. This one says um, you can increase hospital efficiency and improve patient outcomes uh, with AI. And here it is mentioned, well, this is a webinar about how to reduce burnout and improving efficiency with AI-driven workflow. The question is how uh, it has, has this been proven? Is this effect achievable? And this is a publication um, which is also quite relevant. It, in this study, they examined, it's, they call it a technography study. They examined how providers of AI solutions propose and legitimize the values of their solutions uh, in the, for uh, supporting the, di the radiological workflow. Now, how do companies uh, legitimize their values? First of all, they use some external legitimacy, which means uh, they have academic partnerships or other legal approvals that the majority does that. Um, they also want to promote um, financial and they, they promote their financial resources and their technical technological expertise. This is uh, certainly one of the elements um, to legitimize their value. And then of course, they also want to prove it in a scientific way. Uh, more than 50% does it. They look for scientific evidence and therefore they engage in research. And of course, they certainly want to showcase their uh, solutions in practice. But if you look at the, uh, the size of the scientific, uh, let's say activities, it's relatively small. Um, so the scientific proof is still a bit lacking. So the conclusion of the study is that systematic evidence showing the performance and effectiveness, effectiveness of AI solutions on the user side uh, is still limited. The future research needs to extend this study to include the upcoming AI solutions and companies as well as examining how the existing ones evolve. Um, so now, how is this market evolving? It's constantly evolving, the AI market, that is, that is for sure. Um, first of all, we have multiple individual AI vendors. Then we also have now, what you can see is, there's ongoing collaboration between different AI vendors on the same platform. So you can call that some kind of consolidation in the market. But what's also appearing now are several vendor neutral AI platforms that establish collaborations with existing vendors. And then of course, you also have modality or PACS connected platforms. And now we also see pharmaceutical industry in this market with platforms. Now, uh, this is a scheme showing what I just said. We have these individual vendors and you see a consolidation there now. And then you have the marketplaces um, uh, organized by PACS vendors, equipment vendors, pharmaceutical industry, and then independent, uh, uh, let's say companies. Now, how can we select the best vendor? Do we choose for, uh, do we go for an individual vendor or do we prefer a marketplace? So what is the main difference? Um, this is a slide I wanted to show you to explain the main infrastructure that is used for um, AI-based solutions. So most solutions, they will help the radiologist to review the images and to add relevant findings to the report. This was also shown in, in the publication that I just explained. Uh, most vendors, 
they offer cloud-based solutions. But yes, um, of course, some people still want to use on-prem solutions if they are afraid of going to the cloud. So this also depends on the hospital policy, of course. And the analysis is usually, the analysis of the images is usually done in the background, which means that it's automated before the, the radiologist interpret, interprets the examination. Now, these are some examples of uh, marketplaces. So what is the purpose of these marketplaces? Well, they offer multiple or uh, a variety of AI-based solutions on one single platform. And that one single platform has to make a connection with the hospital using the AI solutions or with the radiology department. So the advantage is that uh, by using such a platform, um, well, it, it makes um, it, it makes a more easy access. It, it facilitates the access um, of the radiology department with several solutions. It makes the access also faster and makes the reporting easier because it's one single platform that is connected to the system. Um, the contracting also goes to one party or through one party. And this facilitates the management of these applications as well. Um, and of course, it also reduces the number of PEX connections that need to be secured. And of course, um, it also in a wider hospital network, it provides or it can provide access to all the locations within the same network. And even this platform can be made available for solutions, AI based solutions that have been developed at the hospital or at the institution. This is uh, what I wanted to explain. So this is a, a, a diagram showing the hospital network with several hospitals. And then you have this vendor neutral AI platform with several applications that are being offered. And through one gateway with, e with each hospital, all these applications can be offered, of course, and can be used. Now, what strategy should we use when we want to implement an AI solution? Well, there is this so-called implementation process that needs to be followed and there's a lot of steps you have to plan a business case you have to make the contracts uh, there needs to be uh, clarity about privacy and security so there's a lot of these are all contracts of course the dpa dta dpia they all need to be signed approved and signed the you absolutely need support from the it department and from the pax management as well and of course, you have to think about how to integrate the solution, the workflow. You also have to think about communication and uh, of this uh, solution within the group and within the hospital, and you have to train people having to work with it. And of course, you also have to test the solution. You have to evaluate it and to monitor. This is also part of the MDR legislation, of course. So in my opinion, you can better create a user group. And uh, this is in the hospital, I mean, uh, this is with the intention to support all healthcare providers that have an idea for an AI application, uh, because it will not remain the radiologist using this. And in the, such a group, you can also systematically review all submissions and um, let's say um, build expertise and knowledge around this type of solutions so that you can also make the best choice and selections. Of course, you, uh, by using such a group, you can also ensure the re requirements of an AI uh, infrastructure in the hospital, and you can steer the budgeting of the hospital. And of course, you can also collect, um, uh, you can collect knowledge ar around AI, and you can uh, also use this for management of the AI-based solutions. And of course, this could also inspire all the employees. Now, one important element is also to define the KPIs, key performance indicators, because they quantify the impact of AI tools on efficiency, patient care, and financial returns. You have to think about it. What are the goals that you want to achieve with AI? And this will be also helpful in defining the KPIs. For example, you can think about if you want to reduce the, the duration of the reporting, you have to examine this if this is the case. You have to maybe you want to reduce the time between diagnosis and treatment, or you have to evaluate maybe um, the agreement rate of radiologists. Maybe the solution is not offering solutions that they accept. And you also have to, uh, to monitor the AI performance. Now, I usually go for a three-phased strategy. Uh, the phase one is always the retrospective one, where I do an analysis of the AI solution with a small data set. Uh, 
and this is with a retrospective uh, in a retrospective manner of course and then i go to phase two after approval of phase one i go to phase two where i do a prospective evaluation of the solution this is with a smaller group of radiologists and of course you have to do this in a structured way you have to use these kpis and then you have to evaluate if this solution is creating trust and then if this is finalized and approved um, you can go for the final implementation and then of course you have to beware that all users have to be educated and informed and also you have to have a plan for monitoring and surveillance of the solution so actually it's the end result that matters when you deploy an algorithm you should be able to deliver better quality of care at at least the same cost or you could maybe it could be better if you can even reduce the costs AI should allow to answer the increasing demand for workload reduction uh, because we have we cannot ignore this. There is an increasing workload for radiologists, and of course, uh, the success of an AI-based solution will also be based upon um, achieving this goal. Now, the impact on the outcome must be measured and evaluated to generate confidence. This is certainly the case because you will in a group you will also ha always have a discussion. Um, there's always several opinions about several solutions that you want or innovations that you want to implement. A few words about financing, very short. Don't forget there's a lot of costs involved. It's not only buying the application. You also have to think about the management, uh, the maintenance support, the monitoring, etc. There's uh, So beware of that. And also you can think about several pricing models, of course, with the, with the vendors. The question is, do you pay per application or per exam, or do you buy an annual license? Or do you do do you start with one pilot with only one vendor? Or do you try several, uh, do you make several pilots simultaneously? Um, and then of course you have to, you can make an agreement with the marketplace for multiple applications over the long term. So this is a long-term AI agreement where you invest progressively over several quarters or maybe over several years. So you create some kind of a collaborative model, model and then you do a phase introduction of several applications where you can also test them and evaluate them, of course, and you can also keep monitoring them. So this might be the most ideal solution. Take home messages to finalize. Users and hospitals, they really need to establish an internal procedure and a policy for selecting the right AI applications. Investment is really necessary and funding also needs to be provided. The best thing is to create collaboration agreements with vendors or with marketplaces for optimal implementation and monitoring, don't forget that. And the ultimate goal of using an AI-based solution should be to provide better care in a more efficient and maybe even in a less expensive way. So I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. You. I'm sorry, yeah, thank you. And I will pass now to Pinar who has joined us and uh, Pinar will moderate okay. the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eric. Thank you very much for this great overview uh, you gave us. Um, there's one question already from the audience. Um, do you know of any studies that report clinical outcomes comparing AI-guided treatment versus radiologist-guided treatment? Well, um, actually, the clinical outcome is also different, of course. And this is a phase where we have not arrived yet. What you can see now in the scientific publications is more and more evidence of the fact that AI-based solution can help us in improving the workflow, which means that you can shorten the reading time. For example, if you use an AI-based solution for chest CT scans, you can even uh, reduce um, the reporting time with 30%. But the condition is, of course, that the solution needs to be integrated very well with the existing system, with the system that you use in your workflow, which usually is the PEX. So the better you can integrate this solution in your workflow, the more efficient this will be. This is really important. Um, but it's a good question, of course, the clinical outcomes, I'm still looking for that. Um, and I do know that uh, this is ongoing, for example, also for lung cancer screening in some countries, as in the UK, so theorists will uh, certainly um, know that. Um, in some areas in the UK um, and in some other European countries, 
um, AI is being used to support radiologists in doing lung cancer screening with low dose CT scan. And then of course, from these um, studies, or we will know, we will obtain a lot of information about, uh, let's say, uh, the, the, the way AI can support us in, in making these diagnoses faster and better. It's all about just, just as with mammography screening about detecting timely the interval cancers, et cetera. So, I mean, this is certainly that will be achieved, but this is ongoing. Yes, thank you. Yeah, obviously it's the part of the reporting, but what is also, I think, uh, of interest now is the technical part. That's something we had during the lecture today as well within radiology and also nuclear medicine that, for example, um, the acquisition, uh, the steps before even the reporting, uh, th those are also the steps with it where I AI is being implemented. And yes, of course, will... I mean, it's we only, only mentioned the AI-based solutions for image analysis, but there's a lot more possibilities that are also being used already by several institutions, hospitals, companies, for example, AI-based solution to shorten the scan time uh, so that you can make the scans faster uh, without losing image quality and even improving image quality. Or you can even achieve or make, let's say, synthetic CT scans out of MRI. It's yeah. another application that's being used uh, for the sacroiliac joints, for example, at the University of Ghent. And now I just saw, I have to... Uh, no, I cannot tell that. <laughs> <laughs> the secrets? <laughs> <laughs> yes. No, no, it's, um, of course, this is being, research has been done, but the results are quite promising. So yeah. there's even more information by just converting these images into a CT scan, these MRI images into a CT. So, I mean, there's a lot of new uh, possibilities that are uh, upcoming and probably of which we have never thought before. Indeed, that's what I actually learned today as well within the nuclear medicine side that um, well, parts of the images with iterative reconstruction actually form the whole image without even having yeah. all of the images. So Absolutely. that's amazing. Um, can, let's continue with the other questions in the chat. Ha Mihai Don Mihai uh, asked, how can we get involved as residents, young specialists in the development of these technologies together with AI developers? Yeah, excellent question. Uh, I wish I could give you um, a solid answer, but I do know that um, a lot of hospitals, well, there is, of course, you can see that this is, um, this idea is being captured by several academic institutions where they now create some possibilities for uh, their students to uh, take courses and uh, to start doing research uh, around this. Um, I'm visiting professor in, at the Ghent University myself, and I am now launching uh, the possibility for students to, to make a bachelor or a master thesis about AI. And I'm talking now about students in medicine. So there's a lot of enthusiasm am uh, among these uh, students to participate. And I really love it because um, uh, they really start from scratch and they have to uh, write a thesis about this topic, which can be, of course, um, the topics can be can vary a lot, but you can see that there's a lot of enthusiasm among them to follow uh, or to, to choose for this kind of uh, topics. And uh, I do see there is some progress being made in, in this uh, direction, but um, it will take some time before it's available in a, in a, in a global, on a global level. Yes, thank you, Eric. And I want to uh, add to that also with uh, the great overview that Meryl uh, Heisman gave within the first lecture of papers. Um, and we also have a collection of um, like interesting papers and books uh, within uh, the USOMI website. Yes. So please yes. have a look uh, at that as well. Um, that's, a, that's a good answer. Um, of course, you have to this is why we created this society um, to generate interest and possibilities for students to engage in, in research. And yes, I mean, um, the people joining our society will probably be motivated or pick up new ideas uh, to do this. 
And it distributes, as you say, during yeah. like to the academics and also peripheral hospitals. So definitely, I think the first step is uh, having that thought and intention and going uh, to look for it uh, where you can get most info information and the same minded people as well, I think, to learn Absolutely. from. Absolutely. Actually, we are the first society to have a young club in Europe, yeah. a dedicated young club. So join Yusomi. The <laughs> yes, absolutely. It's um, which is what is also uh, I think important is to find ways to um, stimulate collaboration on a multidisciplinary level. If you want to engage as, as a radiologist or as a radiology resident in research, you have to find partners um, to to do this. Um, I have experience with that in my own hospital. We generated such a research group, and then you can supply for grants. Um, and uh, what you could also do is, for example, even find several users to do research. Um, in the same hospital, we we do research with emergency physicians, both both emergency physicians and radiology technicians and radiologists to see what kind of impact AI has on their workflow, etc. So there's so many things that uh, which are possible to um uh, contribute. Yeah. Yeah. yeah thank you eric we have a lot of questions coming in okay. so um are there any uh, the following questions are there any ai recommended solutions included in any clinical guidelines would this help improve uptake and integrate ai in radiology and make a better argument to use ai is this what is needed in your opinion i didn't understand the first part so solutions for what purpose included in any guidelines. So if there are any AI recommended solutions that are now included in clinical guidelines. Mm -hmm. uh, that's also a difficult question, um, but a very good question, but I think it's too early for that. Yeah. Um, yes, it's, it's at this moment, I have to say, no, I, I don't, I'm not aware of that. Yeah, we have the guidelines for, uh, is what you showed the eclair etc but i don't i actually don't know i think it's yeah this is still in I a think phase we, in, we yeah. have to wait for results about the outcomes and and then we will be able to integrate this in guidelines so it's a stepwise evolution of course but it's too early to uh to do that and perhaps maybe one thing that pops up is uh within um the ophthalmology uh, i mean they also have uh ai using AI now in clinical, but I'm not sure if that's already implemented for. Um... Yeah, it's for analyzing OCT scans. That's true. Yes. That's true, yes. Um, but, but I'm not aware if it's already if implemented. In... No, I don't know. Um, then the following question is, as you showed, there are many stages for implementing AI in care. Uh, for example, DPAI, IT support, PACS support, and many of such departments are short staffed and these staff yeah. don't always see implementing AI as their job role. Have you met such barriers and is there a good way to get these staff on board? Yeah, actually that was part of my slides, right? So this is one of the reasons why hospitals are usually slower in the implementation of uh, AI-based solutions because it's not only radiologists that have to do this. There's a lot of people that you have to get together and work together with and you have to coordinate this. Um, and this is, in my experience, the best way to do this is with a, when you find a project manager who is able to to communicate and uh, follow a plan and um, let's say evaluate every step that is that is being followed etc so yes that's the ideal solution but I'm really well aware of the fact that this is not possible in every hospital and it depends usually depends on the size of the hospital and um, if, even if it's academic or not academic but yeah um, but nevertheless Hospitals have to organize themselves. The, the, the basic, and there's a basic need for a clear view and a policy in the hospital regarding AI-based solutions. Hospitals cannot ignore that this is ongoing. So they have to think about it. They have to find a way to deal with this and to, to tackle these challenges. And um, they have to prepare themselves for that. And that's, that's I think, the main message I wanted to give. Yeah, and I agree. I think also within, uh, it, de it depends on the hospital, uh, I think mainly the radiologists, the radiology and nuclear medicine department also have their own IT. 
mm-hmm. uh, department. So that's already one step ahead. But then, um, for example, as you gave with the lung nodules, you have to um, also integrate that with the persons who are reading the, those reports, yeah. right? And who are yeah. seeing them as well. So it's like, as you said, a multi phase step, but also yes. a multidisciplinary disciplinary step. Yeah. And I think the most think- ideal is that you create this user group, which is hospital wide, yeah. where you have a systematic approach for these solutions. Because I said, as I said, it's not only, radi- not only radiologists that will start using AI, there's many others. So you have to organize this one way or another, and you have to build experience in this. And um, you have to, you, the hospital will also have to make decisions about how much money can we, what kind of budget do we need? Um, how do we make a selection? Because there's 10 specialists now asking for an AI-based solution. So you have to make a systematic approach and you have to discuss about it. You have to uh, publish the results. You have to create awareness. I mean, <laughs> There's a lot of facets, and this is what innovation is about. And uh, yeah. definitely, and then a, a project manager or a user group like that can definitely take the lead and get the yep. full expertise in all disciplines, I guess. Uh, yes, and then also maybe guide scientific research in this domain within the hospital because there will be initiatives, and otherwise everything stays like uh, in their own cycles. And yes, yes, that's why I yeah. totally agree. We have to. Uh, I, I think yes, the, all the people here who are participating, they should understand that hey, this AI software is not a one off self product. No. So it's not like going to RSNA or ECR, looking at the boots and buying something. Yeah, It's about, and I liked very much the concept of collaboration agreement. Each hospital should have with each vendor a separate collaboration agreement. Yes. And this is a completely new paradigm. Absolutely, because I mean, as I said, the, the legal uh, requirements uh, should not be underestimated. Uh, the MDR requires that solutions are being monitored. So we have to find out what is the outcome and how accurate are they? And we have to detect errors. We have to find out if there's a bias because this is can be very subtle. Can the, There can be a bias in specific population groups or minority populations, et cetera. So we will have to follow this and see how this goes. There will be a moment where we detect some error. Another example is, for example, uh, is another example is when you buy a new CT scan. Who says that the algorithm will perform with the same sensitivity and specificity when you create new type of images with a much higher resolution CT or with a totally different technique or a new protocol? So this is really actually something that you really have to think about. Thank you. Um, Benoit Risk asks, do you use AI for smart scheduling workflow optimization for radiologists? Yeah, that's that's also very interesting. And this is also one of the non-pixel AI solutions, let's say. Um, I developed one uh, at the Netherlands Cancer Institute together with a, an AI developer. So we hired one to help us, um, uh, let's say, optimizing the planning of uh, MRI scans. So Usually these are not really on the market. I do know some companies that already offer this type of solutions, but they're not easy to find. Um, although, although I wonder why, because um, this type of solutions does not need a CE mark or does not belong to the MDR. So it's it's a lot easier actually to bring such solutions to the market. But nevertheless, you can see that companies are kind of hesitating to do this. I don't know. And do you think because, again, because of, it's of the implementation that people can struggle with, you know, to change because yep. optimizing the workflow is also changing the workflow, which needs time, which needs yes, agreements, yes, yes. even though it's not, it's not necessary yeah, yeah, yeah. that it has to be C marked. You um, need a good manager to to uh, to implement such solutions and and to make it accepted in the work group as well. So it's not easy, but of course I'm convinced that AI will help us in finding better ways in organizing the workflow. Yeah. Uh, Farzana Ali asks, uh, what are some of the funding organizations you think will be great sources for pursuing AI rece- research? Of course. You have to sub- there's grants and uh, then you have to s- submit a proposal for a grant. This is not easy. Um, 
there's organizations supporting us in doing this if you want to do that uh, academic institutions know usually know how to do that but you have to put a lot of effort in that um, another possibility is that um, you find some kind of collaboration in the hospital with some industrial partners or sponsors um, to set up some multidisciplinary collaboration this is what we do did in the netherlands um, so we there was a kind of initiative of the hospital to promote innovative solutions innovative technology and they found they found partners to um let's say to fund this uh, research so i mean or the of course the hospital should look for an academic partner to to work with in in uh, or collaborate in some kind of research so yeah that's that's for research of course if you want to find funding to buy ai based solutions you have to make a business case yourself and you have to calculate how much time you will gain from using this solution or how many more patients you will be able to do. It depends on the financing system. In every country in Europe, there's a different financing system, which may, makes it also more difficult to give one solution uh, about how to calculate your uh, your return on investment. It all, it really so much depends on the way the healthcare is, is being financed. So it's very difficult to give a, a uh, one Absolutely. single answer to that question. And if I may ask where within the Netherlands, because research worldwide on AI is, well, uh, increasing a lot. It has increased a lot. Do you also find that the uh, funding has increased with, within? Uh, yes. Yeah. Yes. And, and of course, on a national level, you will see that efforts are being generated to, um, let's say, make data more accessible, because this is one of the main hurdles. Oh. It's the availability of data. Where can I find them? And how, how much data do I need to develop an algorithm, etc.? So we do have, all hospitals do have a lot of data available, but the question is, how can they share this in a safe and secure way? Uh, and this is also you can see that um, a lot of initiative is being taken and it should be taken because otherwise if we don't do it in europe other countries will surpass us and uh certainly do it so there's it's a, it's a very interesting discussion on its own how can we make these data available how can we share them and yes is it um for what purposes should this be done yeah um then the next question is uh, from Jaka Potoknik, if I pronounce it correctly. And actually, a question I really like. We did a study where I, AI outperformed referrers and practitioners in justifying CT scans. Do you yeah. have any advice on how to tackle implementing NLP-based solutions within existing risk systems? Do you find online learning when algorithms can learn in real time a valuable, valuable feature? I would like to add that if we could also do that on the, at the ED department, <laughs> because sometimes we get questions for, well, CT scans in which we think like, why are we doing this? Absolutely true. I mean, I've, I've been writing about this. I mean, this is about the clinical decision support systems, right? And uh, both the European Society of Radiology and the American College of Radiology have, have been working on this. They have created a few years, several years ago, they created these um, these, these uh, guidelines uh, to make the right decisions uh, when uh, asking for a specific examination. Um, as far as I know, AI has not been applied to, uh, let's say, um, make these guidelines in practice more applicable or more easily applicable because it should be interesting, however, to see how this can be combined because if you want to create a guideline for choosing the right application well these guidelines should be updated on a regular basis and maybe with an ai um, based solution this can be done automatically mm -hmm. but uh, of course the question is how will this be accepted by the clinical community um is it and and it also de totally depends on the kind of uh, healthcare system. If 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 you work in a healthcare system which is purely or mainly based upon production, I think um, 
it will be very difficult to implement such a solution unless unless there is a an obligation from the authorities uh from the let's say on the national level or from the ministry to do this um but <laughs> i do see a lot of potential in creating such guidelines and using them and also applying ai but the implementation in practice is i think quite cumbersome I think uh, what you are telling us, Eric, is very much in line with a question where from uh, Cor Jungen, who suggests that we may work with international standardized databases to compare vendor solution. Why? I, I think it's quite innovative. What do you think? I, I didn't completely understand. So you have to standardize yeah, you create the evaluation. A standard, of you create a database, international standardized database, where you it's it's software tick the box and the one who ticks more the most boxes it's the one which uh, will be purchased kind of yeah 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 absolutely i completely share that idea <laughs> actually i launched it myself a few years ago <laughs> so i think uh the, these uh, applications applications it might be ideal if we can test them on a kind of a generally accepted standard standard data set, uh, but then you would have to create a data set which is accepted on a national basis or maybe even wider for every different type of uh, AI based solution. So this is a huge task, but nevertheless, it would be kind of the the absolute reference to uh, to see if an AI algorithm is efficient or accurate or not um yeah i mean that that would be the ideal situation i guess but i think it will be quite difficult to establish but it's still i'm still hoping a little bit that this can be generated <laughs> then uh, the last question uh, of this webinar by Suzanne Selmerdin is you said that many hospitals want to test AI solutions for themselves and replicate work done by other centers. What do you think it will take to make people trust such AI solutions? Will there be an end to this or should hospitals all start making provisions to allow them to internal validation per solution uh, if they want to use AI? Now, creating algorithms yourself, homemade algorithms or home-based algorithms, it's not very simple because if you follow the MDR, you can only launch or use an application if there's no existing commercial alternative. So even on a legal basis, there's limitations to do that. If you, for example, are able to create an algorithm that is very specific for a specific purpose in your hospital for which there is no commercial solution available, okay, then you could use it. But nevertheless, you should also do it in a very careful way. Um, and um, yeah, this is this is the main answer I can give. Um, of course, I'm not opposed against developing solutions in in the house, uh, and uh, most of it is being done now for research, of course. And that's also something that we should keep in mind. How far is it research, and how far is it for clinical implementation? Um, and of course, clinical implementation. If we talk about developing solutions for that, then we talk on a completely different level. Yes, and I think within it's as what you said within um, you cannot keep it internal only, and obviously for making it clinic clinically available and efficient and usable, you have to do an external validation anyway. Absolutely. So um, I think with this. We can conclude our session for today. Thank you very much, Eric, uh, you, and Eric. the participants for the great questions and a great overview. Um